I'm really excited um, to have Katia give our next uh, keynote talk. Uh, Katia is an assistant professor at the Department of Design at UC Davis. She, before that, she was a postdoc associate at MIT Media Labs, and she got her PhD and master's degree in Rio in Brazil. Her research interests include wearable technologies, interactive tattoos, beauty technology, and skin interfaces. And her work has been featured by all kinds of really cool places like The New Scientist, Wired, Discovery, CNN, and many others. Uh, recently, CNET recognized her as one of the top 20 most influential Latinos in tech in 2017. And in 2018, she was awarded the Dermal Abyss Project in the science fiction no longer category. And in 2019, she was honored as a leading woman in STEM by Johnson & Johnson. So it's really my pleasure uh, to welcome Katia Vega to the stage. Um, please um, uh, come up. We look forward to hearing your talk. Hello, everyone. Uh, I think right now you are receiving these cards. I will ask you first to, we are kind of like to spread in this big room. I will ask you if you could sit with someone that you don't know. Sit, and let's start. Uh, so we are not using this right now, but just uh, sit with someone you don't know, and then we'll be starting to do this activity. Uh, so I was, I was thinking how I will be doing this talk because uh, I come from a, maybe a different area of expertise. I work mainly with wearable technologies. And I will be sharing with you my process of design different technologies, some of them applying different kind of uh, techniques, different kind of areas since chemistry, biotechnology, uh, electronics, computing, and some of, some of the projects also have machine learning. But I mainly would like to uh, make you think about design. Uh, make you think about what are you creating. And we are creating and designing different tools. And I want you to think about in your favorite hand tool. Uh, I have, for example, here this screwdriver. And when the, maybe the designer, when he creates this tool, was thinking that Okay, we will be using this tool just for taking out the screws or putting it in. But actually, screwdrivers could be also used in different ways. I was also doing kind of a research online, and some people use also for picking eyes, so you could have a whole a block of eyes, but you could have pieces of them, so you could pick eyes. Some people use for planting, so they go to their gardens and put in seeds there, so you use a screwdriver there. It could be kind of a dangerous tool. I won't talk about that. But it could be also used in different ways that maybe the designers weren't planning to be used in that way. So I will just uh, ask you to envision what you create and think about if the tools that you are creating were actually created in the way that they were proposed to. And I will go through different projects that I was creating. And my canvas is the skin. And I will ask you if you could reply this question. And every time I ask this, everyone come up with a different answer. So what, what is the meaning of your skin? Do anyone wants to say something about your skin? Any ideas? Yes, that's a great idea, yes. So you are not exploding or anything because it's kind of keeping everything and protecting your body with this two meter square of surface that protects your organs and your muscles and everything inside of your body. Great. Uh, anyone else? Any other idea how we use our skin or what's the meaning of your skin? Something else? Yes. Great, that's also a great answer. So think about your skin. It lets you know when you touch something when something is too hot or too cold. It lets you know the textures of things. So you have all these sensors already in your body that let, gives you all this information. That's awesome. 
So our skin could be also sensor. But other thing. Someone else? Your skin. Someone else have other idea? What about um, the representation that your skin is also, it's also an actuator? Your skin change color, it lets you know when some emotions are going on inside of you, or maybe some physical reaction, allergies, pump that comes up, and just let you know that something is going on inside of your body. Also, our skin could be a way that represents ourselves. We, our skin is also giving us, giving information about health, also issues, our, about our age. We modify our skin. Uh, we modify that in, in very different ways, and some of them very extreme. We have tattoos, we have makeup too. So I will be talking today about cosmetics and thinking about how the cosmetics evolve over the time. If you think about a red lipstick, I have a red lipstick, my mom has a red lipstick, my grandma has a red lipstick. So the functionality of cosmetics didn't change over the time. So cosmetics are for highlighting or hiding some aspects of our bodies. So I was asking this question because I was wondering if we could extend the functionality of cosmetics with technology. My proposal is called Beauty Technology. And it's a way to embed electronics into cosmetic products. So we could use this two meter square of skin as an interactive platform. So imagine that you could just blink and turn the lights. Or with your fingernail, you could pay the meter. Or by just touching your hair, you could send a message. And I will show you some projects uh, and how I was creating them. This project I call it Conductive Makeup. And this is a combination between chemistry. I was using a chemi chemical process for metallizing fake eyelashes. So these fake eyelashes are not anymore uh, normal fake eyelashes, they are conductive. So it could work like a switch with one on the top of the eyelid, one on the bottom part, and when you close your eye, you could turn on the lights. Or even in this scenario, we could make a drone to fly just by blinking. And uh, so yeah, this is, this is me, I'm a superhero. I have the superpower of levitating objects in my free time. And uh, we're creating this project that just by blinking, I was activating a drone uh, and making it fly. And after I present this project, uh, I was presenting in different places, someone approached to me. And this was Felipe. Felipe was six time Brazilian championship in Jiu Jitsu twice world championship. And he told me that he would like to be a superhero uh, because he had an accident and now he cannot move his body. Uh, he always needs someone to, for example, changing the channels with the TV. And sometimes it's 30 minutes of his life that is not doing anything, waiting for someone to help him. And of course, I wasn't going to put eyelashes and to a guy, so I created this other project that, uh, that use especially fake makeup. The makeup that is usually used in Hollywood for making a big nose or for making a scar, and we embed some sensors there, and we will detecting like different facial movement. We have 45 mu mu muscles in our face that we move it independently in conjunction depending on the gesture we do. But we have like these voluntary movements that we're, we're creating. So uh, we create wink mode. So for Felipe co interact with his TV. And I like to show this image because it was after 13 years that Felipe co turned on the TV by himself. 
And a little bit about my background. Uh, I'm from Peru, as many of you, and I went to Brazil. I went to do my master in computer science and also my PhD in computer science. And during my PhD, I could have the opportunity to go for one year to another program, and I went to Hong Kong. But I went to an arts department that was very different from someone that is from computer science. Uh, because I was thinking about how we create. And we are always thinking about this is a problem and this is the solution. It's a problem, this is a solution. And I went to the arts department and I was looking to the projects of the students and I was looking to that and saying like, okay, but what's the problem? And what's the solution? And they told me that no, this is not how I create. I create a different way that you, as in computer science, you create. I express my passion. I express my passion through different ways and different, and different objects to make people realize new possibilities. Right now, I also consider myself as an artist because I feel like art gives me this possibility to show technologies in a different way that we were aware of. And if when you're creating a new technology, uh, it gave me this possibility to make it more available for the common people so they could understand what I was creating. So I will show you an art project that it was created, uh, it's a video art project that we create also with professionals in Peru uh, to show this possibility that also uh, is, was inspired in Felipe with the different facial movements. So you will see this video how just by blinking, raising an eyebrow, smiling, and closing the lips, different light patterns could be turned it on. So now I will be talking about some other parts of our body surface, and it's our hair. And I was very intrigued about hair because it's something that is public because you could see my hair, but it's also something that is private, no one is messing with my hair. But it's also malleable because I could do all these hairstyles. Uh, so uh, we also create this project, I call it Hairwear, and are these hair extensions that with a chemical process that we metallize and we connect to a circuit, we could detect different touches on hair. So it's kind of like the similar way that your phone works, it's a capacity sensor, so when you touch it, we could detect that, that touch. And uh, we actually, for this project, we use uh, also a machine learning algorithm for detecting different kind of uh, touches on hair, on the tip, straightening the hair, on the, on the top part. Uh, but I think the main, the, the main part is like how we could use these unconscious behaviors that the touching the hair does, but consciously for activating different devices. Like you could touch your hair and send them uh, by the default message, or touch your hair and maybe like a kind of like sci-fi or zero zero saving agent, you could record a conversation. Or even like if you are a girl and you're in danger, you don't want to take out your phone for sending out your location or asking for help. You could just touch your hair and send your location to your family or to friends. Our body surface is also our fingernails. And we create this project that we call it Tech Nails. We use uh, RFIDs kind of like same technology for paying the metro, these chips that are inside. 
but I place that on our fingernails. So imagine that we could have 10 of these chips. So one, you pay the metro, the other one, you pay Starbucks, the other one, you pay the, open the door of your office, of your house, or whatever. All these cards that you had in your wallet could be the tip of your fingernail. And as I also do some art projects, I create also this project called Aqua Digging, that is a DJ controller into the water. So the DJ put her fingernails into the water and different tracks or sound effects could be activated. concepts or ideas are in a book that we brought that is called Beauty Technology Design and Seamless Interfaces for Wearable Computing. And we wanted it to make it available for everyone that wanted to use them. And even we don't even patent these ideas because we believe that knowledge might be accessible for everyone. And right now, even there are some companies that they have, there are startups that are creating with this idea of paying the metro with your fingernail in Tokyo, Japan, China, uh, London. As we were also talking about the skiing, uh, let's envision other possibilities of how we could design with our skin. And the projects I showed you until now were projects that we were placing technology on the top of your body surface. And, but what if we could add technology inside of our skin? If you, if you want to know, for example, your cholesterol levels, you have to go to the doctor and make some blood tests to tell you your cholesterol levels, your glucose levels, or everything that is going on inside of yourself. We were asking this question, can the skin reveal our internal changes? Instead of traditional inks, we were using biosensors. Biosensors are these uh, kind of liquid that it change color depending of different stages of your body. There are, you could see some kind of urine strip, for example, and you could see when it changed color, or even for knowing if you're pregnant or not, there are also some of them. So we were using, this project is called the Dermal Abyss, and we were using different kind of biosensors, like for example here, you could see the high pH is more purple, the low pH is more uh, reddish. And this is a collaboration project uh, when I was a postdoc at MIT Media Lab with Harvard Medical School. We were envisioning new possibilities for biosensors so we could use our body as a way that tell us information that is inside of your body and you usually don't have access to. So these tattoos, of course, I'm not making tattoos for you today, uh, so don't make a line. Uh, so we were using this as a proof of concept of some, some new possibilities that biosensors could have. Uh, uh, but of course, as many drugs, it takes way too many years, maybe five to 10 years to be developed. And uh, right now there are also new researchers that are also creating this kind of po as a possibility. Um, I also received hundreds of emails after this project. And coming back to this idea of what it means to design, and what is our responsibility of researchers when we design a tool. Uh, it was for me very impressive to see receiving emails like from someone that has been for 40 years pinching himself 10 times a day for knowing his glucose levels. And he saw this as a possibility, just watching the color of his tattoo and knowing when he could need more insulin, for example or some, uh, someone else that has a, a daughter, two years old daughter, 
and he said that if he could read his daughter's glucose level, she was just diagnosed with diabetes type B, it could be a good uh, improve for their life. So this makes me think about what we could be designing and how it could be impacting our society. For letting you know some of my ideas of what are my research goals and, and objectives with this, so I have been creating these different wearable devices that not just camouflage the technology, so the technology, all these cables that we usually have when we create our wearables projects, how we could make them seamless, but also the interaction with itself. So the touch of your hair is something, is a, an unconscious behavior that we are using that consciously. Or the change of the tattoos colors, your metal is changing itself, you cannot control. So it made me think about also, and we also have in our papers discussing this in terms of what's the privacy of information uh, not just for the person, but for the other people that are around them. Also, one of the goals I have is to transform some traditional cosmetics into interactive ones. So how the, the way that we have this functionality or that we talk at the very beginning of cosmetics that it was very static and didn't change over the time, how we could also have that as an interactive platform. And and this is because I uh, try to expand what are the, the horizon of expectation of human device symbiosis. What will be like these different kind of pro proposals that we could do with our body and makes also think about what's possible and what's not. Uh, right now I have small lab. I am uh, I'm in UC Davis. Uh, I moved to the design department right now and I have this possibility to design technology. I have uh, students that, that are, are researching with henna to think about not just a kind of like a permanent way, but also like a temporal way to also monitor your body. Uh, other students that are working with uh, actually machine learning and thinking about how we could restyle different site plans for architects, or even uh, this other framework with virtual reality but also smell, so how a smell could also influence our perception. And uh, also one of our recent projects from uh, our master's student, she's researching about uh, mycelium. Mycelium is this mushroom that grow, it could have like different shapes. It's used uh, very much, it's a biodegradable material, so you could put that in your garden and biodegradable. Uh, so there are some, some projects about bricks and projects about cases or packaging and all these different ways that we could envision that. We are using that for do-it-yourself prototyping, so replacing in our design practice of digital fabrication, how we could replace that with this material so we could reuse or rethink about our uh, possibilities for creating with 3D printers or, the, or laser cutters or other, other possibilities with electronics. But now I would like to think about, again, uh, coming back to what's possible, and I, I quote uh, Bill Buxton here, that he said that when I started in this industry, the challenge was whether we could make the things work. But now, we can do anything. The question became, should we do it? And uh, so, going maybe a little bit closer of what, uh, about, this, about this conference, I was talking a lot with Omar Flores and we were discussing about what are the possibilities of artificial intelligence uh, in our community. And we were discussing about what are the different difficulties or challenges that we also have. Not just because of we are Latin, but also what is being created in this industry right now. After the discussions, I created this other project. Uh, it's called Box. Uh, this is a collaboration project with Thomas Lorenzo from CTU in Hong Kong that we were discussing about ethnicity and artificial intelligence. 
This was this an art project that we present at TAI in March uh, in Arizona. And we were creating this gamble, like this machine that you kind of turn it and you could get these candies. Uh, but we put a camera. And we use a commercially available uh, model that could detect your ethnicity. And it locks or unlocks depending on your ethnicity. And we were locking, we were, we were unlocking if you are white. And in, in that, during that exhibition, it was very interesting the results that we observed uh, because uh, in some ways it made me think about what could be happening. Uh, some, of, some of the times we're locking, uh, even if, if there was a failure, they were telling me, no, I'm white, I, 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 why is this not working? Well, machine learning sometimes does not work. It didn't identify you as a white man. Uh, other times, it, it wasn't working for some of the people, and a white guy come and say like, okay, I will give you the candy. So he was in front of the camera and giving candy for everyone else that couldn't have it. So it was like very interesting other, uh, other possibilities. Someone else came with a phone with Donald Trump and put that in front of the camera and everyone could have candy. So it was an interesting idea and metaphor of what could be possible uh, and what, because we were using a commercially available uh, algorithm uh, that anyone could be used with the bias that we already exist and we already were discussing this all, all, all from all, all today of what could be happening, also the error that could be happening also in that, but also the reaction of the people of getting these benefits or not. So, as you know, I ran an activity for you today. And uh, so this is me practicing my design skills and what I have been learning in the design school. And this was actually, it's not my cards. There are cards uh, that were done from University of Washington. And it was uh, created by Batia Friedman and Lisa Nathan. And they were creating this as, a, as different ways that you could be using and discussing different possibilities if you wanted to create new prototypes, if you are stuck in some designs and you wanted to kind of think about new possibilities. But uh, because they were dis discussing about how designers rarely have time to consider the long-term and indirect effects of their technologies. And now I will ask you to think about how we are designing technology or how technology could be designing in our society, but more specifically in how ethnicity is also involved in AI and what could be like those possibilities. So just for letting you know this activity, do everyone has the cards? Yeah, do everyone has a friend? Yes? Uh, so, you, you will have like different kind of, uh, different kind of values here. So these are, uh, for example, you could have the stakeholder cards, the time cards, the values card, the per pervasiveness card. And it was maybe random, so I hope you don't have like the same card. Uh, so basically what we'll be doing is to uh, take a look to your card and you will have around three minutes to go to the back of this card and make a sketch or maybe uh, create uh, this design, whatever you think, but also try to answer the question that is over here. For example, the ones that have the non-target use, it says on the right, identify three roles that involve non-intended use of the system. So what's the system? Uh, right now I think that we could think about this system that we, I, I was describing, but also you are welcome to think about your own project in, in the, the terms of what. So I wanted, I wanted to this, uh, so just for being clear, uh, I wanted to do this exercise or this activity could be something that we could collaborate with our community. So we are all here today because we care about Latin in AI. And 
it was this great, amazing opportunity to share our ideas, so to learn from each other. But now, I'm asking you to think about what it means, ethnicity in arti artificial intelligence, and to think about a specific scenario that it means that has ethnicity in artificial intelligence, and envision what could be the future by using this particular card that you have. So you might have like different cards. So I will give you right now three minutes to think about your answer and to write on the back part of your card what will be that answer. Okay, do anyone have any questions? No? All right, let's do that three minutes now. Just individually, first individually, and then we'll be sharing. So the first part, the first part will be on the back, add your own response. Second part, you will share with someone next to you, your new friend, and then we'll be sharing as a community. Okay? If you don't have a car, please ask our volunteer and just read about it. Let me know if you have any questions. No pressure, but three minutes. Let's try to think about the system is this, about ethnicity and artificial intelligence. This is, of course, a metaphor, so try to envision all their ideas. Maybe you could think about the bank and how like, they could give you a benefit or not, depending on your ethnicity, or like everything that we could see also in the news, like crimi criminal, uh, criminals that could be detected just because of your ethnicity. But uh, the topic itself is ethnicity and artificial intelligence. Okay, uh, so now that everyone created your own idea, I will ask you to share with your new friend next to you, maybe introduce yourself, and try to first read your card, because maybe the, one, the person next to you doesn't have the same card, and share your ideas. Another three minutes. Okay, time up. Uh, Please, guys, finish your last sentence. Okay, so maybe now it's time to share as a community what were your thoughts and what were the discussions that you were having. So maybe we could have like maybe a couple of you guys if, if you wanted to share, maybe share, start sharing what was your card about and what was the response that you generate. So if someone could please share what are your ideas uh, for ethnicity and artificial intelligence. So my card was about pervasiveness or crossing national boundaries and the question that we were reflecting on was basically what would this look like in different, in different countries, what, what would it be the same? And I guess the, the idea is that, I mean, the societal context matters a lot. So the same person, uh, you might look one way and that means something in this country and you go to a different country and that means something completely different. Uh -huh. Or even in some places, kind of, there might be two people who look very, very similar, but their social experience is very different based on their religion or something else. So it's kind of that, how that technology translates is, it yeah. can be very, very different. Yeah, that's, that's great. And also because we are focusing also just in ethnicity, but it could be also their other ways to generate some kind of bias. Do anyone have like a similar card uh, that want to also share? Or any, any other idea? Any other card? Um, <laughs> so I have a sustained friendships time card. Uh, general question is integrating these technologies into our lives how might they influence or change our sustained friendships and family relationships? How we sustain these friendships and relationships? So asking like five years out, uh, how are some ways that this can change? And where my mind went to was, you know, thinking of Latinus and ethnicity as we can see in this room. It's like so broad. Like yeah. it's, it's very, it's not enough to say, oh, I'm Latin. Like it's, uh -huh. it's too broad a classifier, let's say. Um, and then thinking beyond that, like if, if we start thinking about blending ethnicity. So like my cousin is married to somebody who's from Thailand. My niece is this adorable 12 year old that's multiple ethnicity. So uh -huh. how would the sister respond to her? And how might we as people like think of our relationships with friends or family more so? Like if family is just people that you share DNA with, people that you share customs with and mm -hmm. traditions, or how do we redefine that when you get more into blending 
of ethnicities, I guess. Oh, that's interesting. And yeah. even like, do you, in like in the same family, I guess, that could also have like different response to it. So, yeah, interesting. Thank you. Well, uh, well, thank you everyone for taking the time for discussing and also putting all your ideas there. And I will ask you one more thing. Uh, I will ask you to, because I, I feel like as, as a community, we didn't have the time today because we were in this kind of sharing of ideas and new possibilities. And that's why I bring this activity because I thought that it would be a good way of us as a community to have also a voice and to also talk about these important topics for us. So my last request for you is to stand up and come up over here and just paste your idea in this new board that we create here in the wall. So if you please could come over here and just paste. There are, again, not bad ideas. We are just trying to generate, generate new possibilities as a community. So where is our volunteer with the tape? <laughs> um, and well, thank you so much, guys, for sharing and sharing with the community your ideas in this important topic for us. And just, just for finishing, I just wanted to talk about privilege, uh, but not maybe about white privilege, uh, that topic that could be very weird to talk about that now, but about like our privilege, our privilege as researchers, our privilege, the privilege that we have right now, and you think about uh, every time I go back to Peru, it makes me feel in how privileged I am for being a researcher, uh, how privileged I am like to have this opportunity to wake up every day and think about new technologies or new possibilities. And we have now, I think, a responsibility, a responsibility of now also we represent in some way uh, our community, our countries, and I think like we are like the, what I saw today, like this amazing sharing of this of knowledge that you have. It made me feel that we could continue doing that, and this could be also the very very first step of what we could as a community could be also creating together and figuring out what are the new possibilities and how we could encourage not just uh, our small labs or, or our, our community, but also everyone around to think about these topics and figuring out what could be the next steps for uh, ethnicity in artificial intelligence. Um, and yes, and with that, thank you so much. And um, here, if someone has any questions. Thank you. question. Uh, yeah, great. Uh, thanks so much for being here. It's a really fascinating uh, talk. So I had a question about um, kind of where you started with, with beauty. And I was wondering how you see beauty standards change as technology gets. So if your metro card is in your long fingernails, do you expect kind of men to start wearing long fingernails? I mean, <laughs> how does the technology then influence the beauty? Yeah. So that's, that's a very interesting question because I... I always say that I don't try to change beauty uh, in terms of cosmetics or different ways to modify our body. Uh, what I try is actually to extend as a new possibility with technology. And that's also why I use the products that are mainly used for that. So if I, like even the fingernails I was showing to you, uh, these fingernails, I go to a salon and I ask, the, this person that attends at the salon, okay, could you do my fingernails, but could you put this small thing on the tip of the fingernail? And let that person to do their own art and they'll create even like the nails that they, as the way they used to do that. And of course, it's have a change in the way we behave. And because we have to adapt as a new technology, 
Uh, some of them, uh, right now I don't have my fingernails with chips, but sometimes I, I used to have them for a long time. And I get used to, for example, open the door of my hacker space with my fingernail. And uh, for me, it was amazing because I didn't have to take out my wallet all the time for figuring out where is this card for opening it. It was just all the time there. Uh, but in some way, when my nail grow and then I lose my chip, uh, I was like missing that possibility that that technology was given to me. And that's kind of like one, one idea of how also technology could influence uh, our way of, of behaving as we already have some uh, wearables right now. Like for example, you are looking maybe to your messages or other information just because you have a watch that it, before it has just one functionality that was giving you the time, now we have more of them. So I think that technology itself gives you this possibility of re-envisioning how we use also our body and how we interact in different ways. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, thank you guys. Great, so thanks again, Katia. It was really wonderful to hear you speak, and uh, thanks to everyone who uh, participated today. You really, uh, your presence is what really made this a, a wonderful workshop. It was great to meet a whole bunch of faces. If I didn't get you to meet you in person, feel free to catch me later. It's, it was really great to uh, be here to help organize this, and I really thank you all for being here and for participating. Um, so I'm. Uh, I'm not going to keep you long. It's really a thank you to you all for being here. And of course, a thank you to everyone who helped uh, make this happen. You've been seeing a lot of me, but really I was not the main person here. <laughs> it was this whole team of people uh, behind us that, um, that made it possible. So special thanks to Omar, to Jorge, um, to Pablo, to Javier, to the other Javier, and to the other Javier. <laughs> Without you, really, it wouldn't, uh, this wouldn't have happened. And uh, you, yeah, as you all know, you wrote uh, hundreds more emails than I did and did all kinds of coordination. So really, a, a hand of applause to all of our workshop organizers. So on top of that, there are also kind of a whole bunch of other layers that really made this possible. Our workshop advisors, uh, in particular, Excel AI, uh, Laura, Pablo, and uh, Jorge, uh, thanks so much for your invaluable advice and for really getting the ball rolling. Um, Excel AI are, are the people that uh, kind of started this whole LXAI endeavor to, be, to begin with. Um, so we're definitely indebted to them. And of course, to all of you members of the community who helped participate, either by being volunteers, helping us out today, um, being on the program committee, getting the word out. Um, this really happens because of you. Um, so thank you. And uh, last, but of course not least, again, our wonderful sponsors that um, really kind of gave the funds to make this happen, that were able to sponsor all of these flights and get all of you here to participate. Uh, so thanks again to our sponsors as well. So beyond today, I, I do hope that uh, everyone gets to uh, stay in touch, stay in touch with each other, uh, with all these new connections uh, that um, you have made. Uh, feel free to email me, feel free to email each other, and, and do stay in touch. Officially through LXAI, we have our Twitter handle. You can um, kind of follow if you're on Twitter. Uh, but you can also uh, keep an eye on the webpage, where we'll keep posted, posting things of uh, new updates, uh, blog posts, et cetera, uh, other workshops and other events that happen. Uh, there's also a place where you can sign up to be on the mailing list or you can actually uh, kind of be a member or be in the public directory. So it's just kind of a public directory of uh, Latinx people around the world who are working on AI and machine learning. So it's really kind of a fascinating place to scroll through and if you ever are kind of in a new city and want to find someone uh, to meet up with and talk about work or just connect, um, it's, it's kind of a really nice resource to have. I also wanted um, to uh, give a shout out to our fellow kind of diversity in a AI um, cohort. And there's a whole bunch of other groups. Uh, many of them are holding events um, throughout ICML. There's a couple of uh, small half day workshops happening tomorrow, some dinners and lunches and things like that. Uh, so in particular, Black in AI, uh, Women in ML, Korean AI, and AI disability. They've all kind of been a kind of cohesive, co a supportive group as we put together um, these diversify AI and groups, uh, so do keep an eye out for them as well in their events. And uh, last but not least, uh, I hope to uh, see many of you at NeurIPS uh, 2019. We'll be having another 
uh, workshop. I'm not quite sure yet what the form will take, but there will certainly be an LXAI workshop there. Um, so keep an eye again on the Twitter website. We'll be pulling out a call for volunteers and people who want to help make that one happen. So it's uh, really um, been a rewarding experience, and I strongly encourage you to participate, Think about, start thinking about what papers you're going to submit and what else you can do to be there. Um, so uh, uh, kind of official close of the official program up here on the stage. So once again, thank you so much. Um, thanks to everyone who participated, everyone who made this happen, and I hope to see you all again soon. So thank you.